So, the Kuntash has a great great grandson and 12 years after the Aventador launched, it eventually has a successor and this is it. It's called the Revuelto, which is named after a bull that fought in Barcelona in 1880, but it also means something in Spanish. It means to mix up or turn around, which is apt because this car is a big turning point for Lamborghini, the company. Every Lamborghini that follows after this one is gonna be electrified in some way. But don't panic just yet because there's two big reasons why this is still a proper Lamborghini. The first is the styling. It's about as subtle as a roundhouse kick to the temple, as all big Lamborghinis should. And back here, we've got a 6.5 litre naturally aspirated V12. But everything isn't quite as it seems. Yep, you guessed it. It's a plug-in hybrid, except here the electrified part is less efficiency, more insanity. The Tweet V12 on its own produces 814 brake horsepower and 535 pounds-feet of torque, and it will now rev all the way to a screaming 9,500 RPM. The V12 is paired to three electric motors, two on the front axle driving a wheel each, and another integrated into a new eight-speed twin-clutch gearbox. So there's four-wheel drive, there's a 3.8 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery that can be recharged on a seven kilowatt outlet in 30 minutes and delivers an EV only range of around 10 miles and a maximum total power output of 1,001 brake horsepower, which means not to 62 miles an hour in 2.5 seconds, not to 124 miles an hour in seven seconds and a top speed of over 217 miles an hour. Let's start with the powertrain, shall we? Seeing as it's right here on full display, no engine cover whatsoever. Absolutely love that as a design detail. If you've got a massive great V12, you might as well shout about it. So the engine itself, it's 17 kilograms lighter than the one you got in the Aventador. And crucially, it's been rotated a full 180 degrees with the gearbox stuck on the back. Now only two other cars in Lamborghini's history have ever had a transverse rear gearbox, the Miura and the Ascenza SCV12, which was that mad track only Aventador. So it's in good company, but the reason they've done it here is to free up space, free up space down the center spine of the car where the transmission would normally be. So you can house that 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. Clever stuff. Now the gearbox, it's an eight speed twin clutch. It's been developed entirely in house. Lamborghini says it's both lighter and has faster shifts than the seven speed twin clutch gearbox you get in the Huracan at the moment, and that's no slouch, so it's great news. Also, the worst bit about the Aventador was that single clutch gearbox. So much speed and, and competence in that car, and yet when you switch the gear, you got that big slurred nodding dog effect. But anyway, that's all gone. Great news. And then on top of the gearbox, you've got an electric motor. That produces 148 brake horsepower, and has three purposes. It is a starter motor, it is a generator, so it can feed energy back into the battery, and it can supply additional power to the rear axle in conjunction with the V12. And then if we come to the front of the car, you've got more electric motors, two more to be precise, on the front axle, and that unlocks many things. One motor for each wheel. These again produce 148 horsepower each. They weigh about 18 and a half kilograms each, but that means you get four wheel drive. You get torque vectoring for improved cornering and you don't need a reverse gear because when you want to stick it in reverse, it's the e-motors that do the reversing. And get this, if you want even faster reversing and more grip when you're going backwards, the motor at the back can chime in too. Deliciously useless. And then there's the chassis. It's all new and something Lamborghini calls the mono fuselage. Essentially, it's not just the monocoque that's carbon fiber, but the entire front structure too, making the chassis 10% lighter than the Aventador and 25% stiffer. There's also four-wheel steering, significantly stiffer anti-roll bars than the Aventador, and the steering ratio is reduced by 10% for an even flightier feel. Right, so let's talk about the way this thing looks. And for me, the measure of a good Lamborghini is do you want one on a poster on your bedroom wall? And the answer with the Revuelto for me is an unequivocal yes. And I'm not just saying that because in the new issue of Top Gear magazine, we're giving away a giant poster with this car on it. 
Right, the front end. So I'm getting shades of Huracan Technica here with the where the orange bumper wraps around and you've got these sort of predator style fangs underneath. This car has active aero on it. So you've got flaps in the front, you've got a movable wing at the rear, 66% more downforce than you got with an Aventador. The wheels, so 21 inch at the front, 22 inch at the back. You've got bespoke Bridgestone tires on this one, 4% wider front tires. So that should eradicate any understeer whatsoever. And the latest generation uh, ceramic discs, except here, they're 10 mil wider than you got on the Aventador Ultima. Moving down the side of the car, lots and lots of aero devices, as you'd expect. This winglet here behind the front wheel just smooths the air down the side of the car until it arrives at this vast array of intakes here, which just gulp the air in. These are for cooling. This one up here is the engine intake. And you might, you might have to get a bit lower actually, get a good angle of these incredible flying buttresses here. You might get some fresh air through there. Now, I'm not sure how much aero benefit they have, but they look damn good. And if we come around the back of the car, this for me is where Lamborghinis always bring that drama and the Revuelto is no different. In fact, this car isn't that much longer than an Aventador, despite having the gearbox behind the engine here, but you get a real sense of it having this long tail and it tapering towards the rear. And there's just so much going on from this angle, isn't it? I can see right back through those flying buttresses. You've got the exposed V12 there. I've said it already, I absolutely love that. If you've got it, flaunt it. Then a series of vents and ducts and this bit here, this section, this is the movable rear wing currently sitting flush with the bodywork and just above these twin exhausts here. There's actually four pipes if you look closely in there. And the reason they're set up high is to leave the big diffuser down at the bottom to do its good work, to create all that downforce that we talked about earlier. It's quite a thing, isn't it? I could stare at it for hours. Let's have a look inside. Okay, so the interior of the Revuelto. What can I tell you? Well, it's completely new, of course. And the first thing is these seats. So they're nicely bolstered, but the middle sections are quite rigid. We're used to that from Lamborghini, of course. Whether they will absolutely destroy your lower back on a long journey remains to be seen. There's also quite a lot more space in here than you got with the Aventador. I like the fact that they've scalloped out the doors here. So there's loads of room for your elbow and this center stack, this center console with the battery underneath is at just the right height for resting your elbow on there. And then behind the seats, there's actually a decent amount of space for chucking a few squishy bags in there. There's a shelf for putting all your stuff on behind you. A shout out as well to the view that you get in the mirrors in this thing. Because if I look in the wing mirror there, you can look right into those gaping vents along the side of the car and through those flying buttresses at the back. And here I've got a lovely view of my 6.5 litre naturally aspirated V12. In terms of screens, there's three of them. Um, digital instrument cluster behind the wheel, of course, a portrait screen in the middle, but here it's floating, which is really clever actually, because it, creates all this space underneath it for your phone and your sunglasses and whatever you need. There's two USB sockets in there. Um, we've got the famous flip up cover from the start stop button, the familiar gear selector here and more space and rubberized mats for your bits and bobs. And finally, the third screen over there is for your passenger so they can see by just how much you're breaking the speed limit. But the real story in here is right in front of me. It's the redesigned steering wheel. You've got four dials on here. This one down here manually adjusts the rear wing at the back. This one over here is for the nose lift system. This one here is for three new, let's call them sub modes. So you can decide whether you want it in EV mode, in recharge mode, or in hybrid mode. It's kind of an overview of how you want the powertrain to behave. And over here we have four driving modes. So three of them we're familiar with, Strada, Sport, and Corsa, and the fourth is a new one called Cheetah. 
In this new mode, Città, which means city in Italian, it defaults to EV only mode and limits power to just 180 brake horsepower. If the battery's running low though, the V12 can fire up and fully recharge it in just six minutes. In Strada mode, the V12 is always on and maximum available power rises to 874 brake horsepower. Active Aero and Torque Vectoring are now switched on. In Sport mode, max power goes up to 895 brake horsepower, the exhaust clears its throat and the gearbox and suspension are all sharpened up. Finally, with Corsa Plus Performance mode engaged, Everything is unleashed. The full 1001 brake horsepower, the ESC can now be fully disengaged and launch control can be activated. Some final thoughts then. The first is that for me, the line between what a hypercar is and what a series production supercar is, thanks to this, is forever blurred. First, the Ferrari SF90, also a hybrid supercar, and now this. Both of these have a thousand horsepower, do not to 60 in a little bit over two seconds. How could you possibly want anything that is faster or more exotic than that? And this has one distinct advantage over the Ferrari in that you get the sound and the anger of a naturally aspirated Lamborghini V12. Now, the success of this car rests on three things really. Whether it moves the game on for Lamborghini in terms of styling, speed and technology. And on this pretty brief first encounter, I can definitely give it three ticks there. And the final question is whether it can bring some proper drivability along with all that drama. And for that, you're gonna have to watch this space. <laughs>